Okay, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. We're going to get started any minute now. Um, while everyone is kind of settling down a little bit, um, I want to again remind everybody about the evening session at 7 p.m. Peter Neumann uh, will wave here. Uh, not only can you go to the workshop page and find his email and contact him that way, you could actually contact him the old-fashioned way right here in the front row. Um, and I think we're kind of hoping maybe we can get all the speakers together at the end for a picture. I think that would be really nice. So. Um, if, if you're speaking today and you're willing to stick around, that would be great. I'll remind everyone I'd love to get signatures on all the shirts. Okay, enough, uh, enough uh, administrivia. Um, our first speaker for, in our after lunch session is Andrew Herbert, who um, was a former chair of Microsoft Research for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. He was also SOSP general chair in 2005. Um, he is right now, speaking of history, working to um, construct a replica of the Cambridge EDSAC computer as it was in May 1949 when it first ran. So that's pretty exciting. Um, he developed ANSA middleware, was a predecessor to CORBA, and was a key contributor to the Zen project. And today he's going to be talking about the history of virtualization and virtual machines. Please welcome Andrew Herbert. Thank you. So I thought I had retired. Um, that was my excuse to get on and build the EDSAC project. And I'm not building EDSAC. I play with old aeroplanes. Um, it was nice to get the invitation to, to come and speak here. It's even more pleasing because the flying season in the UK stops at the end of September. So you timed it perfectly. So I, I was invited to speak about virtualization. Um, and it's an interesting topic, if only that there was a lot of very early work that went on. And suddenly it disappeared from the SOSP agenda for nearly 20 years, and now it's come crashing back with a vengeance. And it's quite interesting to see how the ideas have been resurrected and some of the changes over that period. My first challenge in doing all of this was actually to arrive at a definition, let me start the timer, to start at a definition of virtualization. I looked in Wikipedia, and the definition there isn't very helpful. It says virtualization is the art of running virtual things. It doesn't really tell you what, what that means. Um, and some of the early definitions are, were very focused on the idea that you're trying to run um, little mini clones, if you like, of the underlying host system. And that didn't span the world where we think of things like the Java virtual machine, whereas part of virtualization, we're also changing the, the semantics of the environment in which applications run. So I constructed my own definition, and you're welcome to quarrel with it and invent a better one of your own, that, that virtualization is a property of operating, operating systems that gives the illusion of efficiently running multiple independent computers known as virtual machines. And the um, software that provides that illusion is known as a virtual machine monitor or, or hypervisor. Um, and really the important word in that is the concept that what is being offered as an abstraction is a complete computer in its own right. And the person writing software to run in the virtual machine does so as if they were writing on a, a raw piece of hardware of their own. The changes that have happened over the history of virtual machines are from the early days where it was exactly mimicking the underlying hardware. And indeed, the aim was for the, the virtual machine to run as much as it could on the, the basic physical machine itself. Increasingly these days, more of that virtual environment is abstract and I've got some things to say about some of those abstractions as we go through. I'm going to break the talk up into four related areas. Obviously, the, the place to start is talking about the origins of virtual machine monitors themselves. Then I want to look at layered abstract machines, something that Barbara Liskoff mentioned this morning. It's obviously very strongly related to the, the virtual machine concept, the idea you might build an operating system by developing ever more abstract layers until you get to the layer that you're prepared to offer something to the user that you think is an improvement over the raw hardware. I then want to look at um, virtualization as it appears in operating systems processes. The history of operating systems has been about offering a cleaner interface to the user for writing their applications than that of the raw hardware and see what some of the virtualization concepts are there and then finish up by looking at how we might address virtual resources. And that's where I get a chance to reflect a little bit on my background in capability systems um, and speak up for them, um, certainly in their role as low-level system names. 
So the origins of virtual machine monitors go back to the very early days um, of virtual memory. Um, as we heard in, in Satch's talk, virtual memory was invented by Manchester University for the Atlas computer. And what they were trying to do there was to automate or make transparent what had previously been called overlaying. If you were writing for machines before paging was invented and your program or your data were larger than the machine's memory, and typically in those days machine memories were as small as perhaps 16 or 32K, you had to arrange to swap things backwards and forwards between a drum or a disc and the memory of the machine. At the Atlas team invented the paging concept and they found that typically gave them performance improvement of two to three times over the manual method and gave the application programmer the nice clean abstraction of a large address space, parts of which could be executing in the physical memory of the machine. And Peter Zenning talked about the, the concepts of working set and so forth. Well, in the early stages, people were interested in researching what those page replacement policies might be. IBM were very excited by the paging concept IBM always had a tradition of inventing their own names for things, and so they called paging dynamic virtual memory. Um, talking to some of the people who were around at that time, we think they picked the word virtual as a kind of illusion to um, optics, and that you know, your program was running in a virtual image um, of this extended store that was mapped into the physical page frames. So to explore different algorithms for page replacement, a team um, at IBM built a modification of their 7044 machine and a little operating system for it that effectively allowed multiple virtual machines to run in parallel, each with its own paging algorithm, so they could measure those things and compare their performance um, and arrive at some ideas about different paging strategies. And indeed, that led to the, the early papers, for example, work by Les Lady and others um, that kind of opened up the field that uh, Peter Denning worked in. Others in IBM saw this structure and thought they could exploit it to write operating systems. And essentially, there are a series of intermediate steps on the IBM 360 machine, where particular models were modified to have the support needed in the hardware to do paging. And people wrote operating systems, or control programs, as they called them for those machines. And this gradually evolved into a product system called VM 370, um, which became the, the flagship for virtualization. For IBM, Virtual machines addressed three needs that they had as a company. Um, it gave them a way of doing time sharing. The concept was very straightforward. You gave each online user a virtual machine. In that virtual machine, they ran a conversational operating system and did their program development independently of what other people were running in their virtual machines. And so it was a nice model for, for time sharing. Um, Importantly, one of the challenges that IBM, like many other manufacturers of that era, faced was um, they needed to be able to run old applications on new machines. I think Satcher mentioned the, the problem of every new machine came with a new instruction set. Um, and um, in IBM's case, those new machines also came with new operating systems. And part of the challenge was wanting to be able to run multiple applications under multiple operating systems on the same machine and the virtual machine monitor concept gave them a way of doing that. And then the third advantage um, was that it allowed developers inside IBM to develop new operating systems using the virtual machine concept as a way of doing so. And so all the kind of development tools they have for programming applications could also be there for, for developing operating systems. And they got away from the, the model that many other manufacturers um, suffered from of needing to have dedicated machines for people to do systems development. Um, and many of us who did our research on operating systems in the early 70s remember waiting until nighttime when the users went away and you could take over the machine. And then you could go and load your version of the operating system. The Cambridge model of that was you'd come into the lab mid-morning. Um, I'll explain why mid-morning when I get to the end of the cycle. You would spend the afternoon coding your magnificent change to the operating system. At 6 o'clock, the users would go away. You would boot the machine with the image of your new operating system. It would instantly crash and produce a large dump, at which point you would go to Roger Needham to the pub. You would drink significant fractions of beer, um, go, and, go and have an evening meal, usually something of... Uh, very absorbent nature, and then come back into the lab at about midnight and try and work out what the bugs were in your program and fix them. And you got home about four in the morning, which explained why you didn't come in until 11 the next morning. Um, the IBM VM model um, was a way of getting around those restrictions. 
So the structure of VM370 um, was very straightforward. At the base of the system was their virtual machine monitor or control program. It did um, a few very simple things. It provided um, the scheduling of the virtual machines. It provided paging for the virtual memory. Files were represented as virtual disks. The physical disks on the machines were partitioned up into what were called mini disks. And inside each virtual machine, it looked as if you had an IBM computer with slightly smaller disks than the, the mainframe machine. You could share files with other people by both of you having the same mini disk mounted in your virtual machines and synchronization between them. And if you wanted to use physical devices, then the control program is responsible for allocating those. For the users, the operating system was called CMS. This was essentially a shell that let you um, edit and run programs on a timeshare basis. There was a VM that ran something called the Remote Spooling and Communication Service that did what it says on the tin, um, looked after spooling, looked after networking to other machines. And importantly, you could also run VMs with other IBM operating systems in it. And in fact, we did this at Cambridge, our university data center. Um, its first IBM machine ran something called MVT. And um, when we got a successor machine, we wanted to move to MVS, but that required rewriting of the software. And so for the first couple of years of the new machine, we ran MVT under VM370 while migrating the software to MVS, and then ran MVS as the native system after that. And that was a very common paradigm for the users. Virtualization, um, virtual machines were a popular topic in SOSP in the early days, particularly the early 70s. Um, and people looked at extending the idea to other computer architectures. An important paper from that peer was written by um, Jerry Popek and Robert Goldberg, which tried to formalize what it took for an architecture to be virtualizable, because they discovered that not every machine um, could be um, turned into a, a virtual machine architecture. And they talked about um, machines which are capable of pure virtualization, as opposed to those which required some kind of hybrid technique. And by pure virtualization, they meant that um, all the, all the sensitive instructions that reveal processor state were privileged, and therefore, um, when you were running in the simulated privilege mode inside a virtual machine, that would generate a trap, and only those instructions had to be executed by software. And so your virtualized um, operating system supervisors running inside the virtual machines mostly ran as native code, and that got you the kind of performance you require for the system to work well. They contrasted that with hybrid virtualization where, the un where there were unprivileged instructions that revealed system state, um, things, for example, as the absolute addresses of memory segments or various kinds of processor status word. Um, and that presented more problems because essentially those had to be simulated. And in the worst case, you'd have to run the supervisor state, or the, um, the virtualized supervisor state as a simulation, which is very slow and expensive. Um, People invented all kinds of hacks and ways of getting around that in various other machines where they tried to virtualize, um, but it always imposed some kind of limitation on the, the systems you could run inside a virtual machine. One of the techniques that we'll talk about in um, the more recent virtual machines is using binary rewriting to fix that. That wasn't an option in the late 60s, early 70s. The address spaces were so small there were no holes into which you could put code that you wanted to jump to. Um, and so the, the concept was you had to do this by trapping and simulation. It was the only way to get into a bigger address space. Um, and that was kind of really rather restricting. And jumping again slightly forward in the history, um, in the Intel world, the Intel architecture only became, cure, uh, only became pure um, when they introduced their virtual machine extensions. Um, and many of the virtual machines that were done in the, the early 2000s were also hybrid by the, uh, the definition that um, Popek and Goldberg produced. So that was the early history. Um, and by 1975, which is, I think, when I read my first SOS proceedings, I came to my first SOS in 77, it was kind of all done. Um, and nothing happened in, very much happened in the virtual machine space until 1995. There was a, a huge vacuum. IBM continued with VM370, a very successful system for them commercially. Um, and I'm sure there are places where it's still running on their more recent um, mainframe machines. There was a little flash of interest in recursive virtual machines. Um, could a virtual machine itself run a virtual machine monitor for a virtual machine and layer down? Um, that seems to be mostly of academic interest. I couldn't find any practical applications. Um, it had an impact on the CAP machine that I worked on as a student with Wilkes and Needham, 
The process uh, model we had in that machine allowed us to have a process hierarchy so we could think about doing recursive things. We never used it, and it was one of the things that impacted the overall performance of the machine that made our hardware capability architecture less efficient than it might otherwise have been. Um, and so that was a bad idea. I don't believe in process hierarchies. Then in the uh, mid-90s, virtual machine monitors made a reappearance. Um, but in a different way, the research wasn't on the engineering of the virtual machine monitor itself. It was using them as a way to achieve um, what I've called here special effects. Um, and there are, there are two papers that particularly illustrate this. Um, Fred Snyder and his colleagues looked at using a hypervisor to essentially track and order events um, going into replicas, um, which they ran in separate virtual <coughs> machines so that they could um, do the kind of consistency mechanism needed um, to give themselves state replication and state consistency. Um, and they were hoping that that would give them a software-based approach that would compete with some of the um, hardware-based replication mechanisms that people were using at the time. They found it imposed an overhead. Um, that overhead um, was about a factor of two. And the problem that the people who were doing hardware um, replication had was by the time they designed their replication, hardware had moved on. So their, their, their replication platforms ran at about half the speed of the next generation. So it was kind of a score draw, to use a soccer analogy, um, in terms of the two approaches. The other paper, which I think was quite influential a um, little bit later, um, was work by Peter Chen and his group, where they used a virtual machine um, as a means to collect the events going on in the system so they could go back and look at the logs later and do intrusion analysis. And so there's a kind of model here of using a virtual machine monitor as a way to transparently intercept what's going on inside an operating system and use that to subtly change the semantics or recall what's going on inside the system. And I think those systems were quite interesting from that point of view. Then the agenda moved on back to looking at how to do um, virtualization for the purpose of running multiple operating systems, the old IBM problem again. Um, that arose um, because there were people who wanted to use one operating system for their research and their development, um, typically a Unix-based system, but they had a requirement to use PowerPoint for their presentations, and so they wanted to run Microsoft um, on the same platform. And so the, the technical problem was operating system coexistence. Um, and um, a number of companies produced products to do that. Um, VMware, for des um, VMware Desktop for Windows is a particularly well-known one. Um, and the idea there is that the virtual machine monitor runs um, as an application um, in a host operating system. Um, and the virtual machines run the guest operating system. So if the host is Linux-based, the guest might be Windows. Um, and in that context, the virtual machine monitor could use the host operating system services to access the filing system and access the, the network and so forth. As I was reading through the papers looking at this, um, I thought that was kind of a new idea that, that appeared with um, the VMware system and others like it. It turns out actually a similar idea was explored quite early on at um, MIT um, for the DEX System 10 where people working on the incompatible time-sharing system wanted to solve the problem of how they could develop new versions of their system and built a virtual machine monitor to help them do that. Um, the DEC 10 itself wasn't an architecture that allowed you pure virtualization, um, so they had to impose some limits, but given what they were trying to achieve, they were able to work around those quite successfully. And so the Type 2 VMs came along to solve the, the problem we had on desktops. Another important system um, in the late 1990s was the, the disco system, which really um, was the start of reinvigorating looking at virtual machines running on the, the bare metal. Um, in the literature, people classify um, virtual machines that run on the bare metal, like, I, I like um, IBM's VM370 as type one, the ones that run embedded in the host operating system as, as type two. The problem the disco project wanted to solve was they had a large, scalable, multiprocessor um, workstation machine. And basically, they had more computes than they knew what to do with. And so they wanted to be able to run multiple users on that machine. So they're kind of heading back to a mainframe architecture and wanted to be able to run multiple operating systems. In particular, they wanted to run commodity operating systems because of the investment in applications they have for that world, but also develop um, new operating systems for some of the computational things they wanted to explore on the multiprocessor architecture. 
The hardware they used um, was silicon graphics machines. Um, again, that um, didn't have the architectural support that you needed to do pure virtualization. So they had to go down a hybrid approach. But now we're in the era where machines have much larger address spaces. And so they essentially introduced two techniques in their virtual machine monitor um, to um, produce their system. They used binary rewriting so that when an image was loaded into the machine, they could look for the sensitive instructions that didn't trap and replace those with code um, that either generated a trap or simulated the behavior they required. And they worked out a way in which the, um, the state of the physical processor that needs to be accessible to the virtual supervisor could be achieved by shadowing. So essentially the supervisor running each virtual machine worked on the shadow data structures and the virtual machine monitor made sure that the shadow data structures were up to date with the hardware. And if there were changes in the hardware, they were propagated through to the shadows. If there were changes to the shadows, they found their way into the hardware when the virtual machine was, sched was, was scheduled. And that worked um, very well. And that technique was, was copied by many others. Interestingly, um, the people who worked on Disco are the authors of the patent which is um, held by VMware um, and um, first attributed to their Type 2 system and the VMware for desktop machine. And so there's a, a definite path there from research at SOSP into an industrial system. There were then a flurry of papers looking at how to um, do a better job of engineering virtual machine monitors. Um, again, sticking with VMware, there's, I think, a very important paper um, by Waldsperger where they looked at the problem of how you stop the virtual machine monitor fighting the operating systems in the virtual machines. Um, if you think, for example, of paging, inside each virtual machine, there is a paging system that is choosing based on the behavior of the applications in that virtual machine, which pages to throw in and out of memory. If the physical machine is under committed, you might like to allocate more memory to that virtual machine so it can expand. But then you've got the problem of which virtual machines you take it away from and how do you stop that virtual machine becoming overcommitted? And so um, a number of, I think, important concepts came out of that work. The first was the idea of ballooning to solve the memory problem. Um, each, the, the virtual machine monitor, essentially reserved a chunk of space inside each of the virtual machines. And if it wanted to encourage a virtual machine to give up memory, it expanded its balloon that made that virtual machine throw out some of its pages and then that could be used and recycled to another virtual machine. Particularly if you're running multiple copies of the same operating system, you'll find there's often duplication of content, the, the binaries of common programs, the binaries of the operating system itself, and so forth. And so they had a content-based um, scheme for detecting that the same page was being used by multiple virtual machines, and therefore they could all share the same physical copy and memory. And those ideas, I think, were very important in making the modern generation of virtual machines operate very, very efficiently um, and multiplex the, the resources statistically across all the virtual machines running on a server. That was less of an issue for the desktop virtualization systems because typically they're only running one or two operating systems in parallel. Whereas when you got to server virtualization, particularly on some of the, the larger servers, you'd be talking about running tens if not hundreds of virtual machines at the same time. These hybrid schemes came with some cost in performance. You had to do um, things like the, the binary writing and the shadowing and maintaining that information consistent. Um, and so now this, another strand of work um, typified by the, the Zen papers. Um, Jenna was a little bit generous. Um, it was some of my staff who evolved in Zen. Um, and Zen certainly picked up on some of the ideas from some of the earlier Cambridge operating systems I've been involved in. Um, but I don't, th don't think I can take any blame um, or guilt by association um, from the, the Zen work. Um, their concept was um, called para virtualization. And the idea there was if you're willing to modify one of the um, guest, op modify the guest operating systems, the virtual machine monitor could provide an interface that allowed the virtual machines and the virtual machine monitor to work more collaboratively to better optimize the handling of resources. So tackling the same problem um, that the VMware guys are trying to do with techniques like ballooning and content-based page sharing, but this time doing it by being more explicit. So the virtual machine monitor wasn't so much trying to, to guess, um, but knew exactly what was going on. The, Advantage of the para-virtualization approach was um, that the performance numbers looked better, 
The disadvantage was you had to have access to the code of the operating system you're hosting the virtual machine to make those changes. Um, and particularly that required sorts of access. Then there was a, a, a definite problem with some of the, the more commercial operating systems. And kind of where we are today, um, now that the dominant processor that most people use, the Intel machine, has the virtualization support in it, a lot of those issues have kind of gone away because we're now back in the world of, of pure virtualization. We do still have to look at the um, statistical multiplexing of resources problem, um, but we certainly um, have more of the of virtualization done for us through the, the harbor architecture. I think it's useful to reflect on why virtual machines have come back um, and why they are popular and why I think they're going to be with us for, for some time to come. Obviously, the desktop um, operating system coexistence problem is one which is still with us. Um, and indeed, as I look around the room, I see a lot of machines running uh, multiple operating systems. For the server virtualization, um, then um, server consolidation has been very important. As the processors have got larger, we want to be able to run lots of services on the same box, but we need strong isolation um, when they're multi-tenanted, running different users. The virtual machine system gives us that. We want the statistical multiplexing resources to make them more efficient, um, and the virtual machine model has become the model of choice for managing, ser managing server workloads. Most of the virtual machine systems give us a management interface for doing that. I'm out of time, but I'm going to skip over just a couple of areas that I would have mentioned if I had more time. Um, I wanted to pick up on the same issue um, that Barbara talked about of layered abstract machines. She covered that very nicely, um, but make a comment that a number of people explored um, layering as a technique to make their systems more secure, dealing with the challenges of the orange book that Butler mentioned. But they found a conflict between how you want to modularize your system from a software point of view and the layering abstractions you wanted from your operating system. And initially, all the systems that use layering were done by people with a programming language background. Um, others felt layering might be inefficient, but Doug Comer's work on Zynu um, showed us that um, it doesn't have to be the case. I'm going to skip over virtual environments, because I think much of that has been said, um, and come to what I'd like to leave you as, oops, overshot. Don't you love Microsoft technology? What I wanted to raise as some of the talking points coming out of the material, um, the first is to go back to some of those systems of the middle 90s and ask whether there's more mileage that we can obtain from using virtualization essentially to modify the semantics of an operating system. Um, I think there's some interesting work there. There's more that could be done. Um, when I was with Microsoft, I had a group who were looking at using some of those ideas to do things um, concerning real-time scheduling, for example. I think there's a challenge in understanding security and virtual machine monitors. A virtual machine monitor is not a trusted computing base. The security perimeter kind of threads all over the place, particularly in the type two systems where you're relying on a host operating system. And I think there's some serious exposures there. It'd be nice to address those. Um, I do think it would be interesting for us to revisit layered abstract machines as a system design implementation principle um, because it does, I think, lead to um, a simplified implementation approach and makes your system more amenable to um, being verified as being correct. And that takes me to my final point. Um, my, my reference for verification of layer systems in the early days was all done by manual verification. More recently, we've had work such as that done on the um, SEL4 system, um, which has shown that a modern operating system can be automatically verified, um, and that work goes on. And so my question to the community um, is, why aren't systems proved correct by default these days? We seem to have the technology to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. This is the SOSP principles. Uh, Thank you very much. Sir. Um, uh, does anyone have a quick question for Andrew? Uh, my fault, we got us started a little late after lunch, but if we have a quick question, I hate to not give people a chance to uh, ask. Yes, here. I had too much material. 
I'm surprised we aren't getting more comments of that kind today right. because there's just 25 minutes to overview a whole area. There's I think a number of yeah. us hope to put together some kind of <laughs> compendium of papers and there'll be certainly more depth in those. Oh, that would be a really nice right. addition. Great idea. Okay. okay thank thank you. you so much, Andrew.